Hi, this is Elwin Robinson, and I'm so excited today to be joined by um, Daniel Vitalis. Um, he probably needs no introduction, but I'll just give him a little bit. You know, Daniel is an expert on, um, on herbalism, on wild foods, on genealogy, on um, high-quality water. He's got all sorts of awesome sites, including DanielVitalis.com, of course, um, SurfRival.com. We'll put links to all those underneath. Um, and finalspring.com, probably my most commonly recommended website. <laughs> so uh, thank you so much for joining us today, Daniel. Yeah, really good to be here, man. Thank you, Alan. <laughs> so um, I asked you to join us today um, to get your perspective, particularly on tonic herbs and wild foods, because I think, um, in fact, a lot of people don't realize that a lot of the time they're the same thing, right? Yeah. And, and what they're for, what their benefits are. And I think a lot of the time people think kind of in the box with them. Like it's a lot of people ask me for a dosage as if they were like an aspirin or something like that. And um, I just want to like broaden people's minds about all the amazing kind of aspects of them. And I thought, you know, who better to get on the call about that than uh, yourself? <laughs> Um, so, yeah, do you mind just showing us a little bit about your own personal story? Like, what got you interested in tonic herbs in the first place and wild foods? Sure. Okay, yeah. So, tonic herbs, wild foods, like you said, in certain ways, these are synonymous topics. But my quest all began back when I was really curious about what natural human diets looked like. I mean, that was my fundamental interest. And that led me through to a lot of different diet approaches. It eventually led me into herbalism. And, you know, eventually led me to wild food. So here's my perspective on how this whole thing works. See, human beings come from environments, wild environments, right? We come from nature um, originally. Now, this is a long time ago because for about 10,000 years, we've been in a process of domesticating ourselves, which means that, you know, I love to stop and say, hey, what is domestication? Domestication means of the house or of the household. So for 10,000 years, we've been working on this process to make ourselves more and more of the household and less and less of the wild. Mm -hmm. But human beings who used to live in the wild, and there are these people who still live in the wild, right? Very few of them, very rare kind of um, – circumstance, but there are people in the New Guinea area, there are people in South America, there are people in Africa who are still hunter-gatherers, they're still wild people. Um, then there are people who live sort of in between that, there are people who live much closer to nature, and of course there are people who live almost completely divorced from nature. When we look at hunter-gatherer people, we see that they're eating, say, let's say 100 to 200 different, discreetly different species of plants per year. Okay. 100 okay. to 200 species of plants per year. Now let's take the fully domesticated human, the completely domesticated factory farm food fed, processed food fed um, domestic person. They're eating about 10 plants per year. Really? Wow. Yeah, about 10 plants per year. And those plants are pretty easy to go through, right? That would be oranges, apples, potatoes, tomato. You know, there's just a few. Hmm. So... What happens is the process of domestication, we could say, would be the process of isolating ourselves from more and more species. It would be this process of cutting all our ties that kept us internetworked or intermeshed, networked into environments until we become so of the household that only a few species are allowed into our sphere, into our life, particularly into our mouths and our bodies. And those species that we do allow in are only domesticated species. So when human beings domesticated themselves, it wasn't just themselves, right? It was other animals and plants. So we domesticated um, from the wild ram, the sheep, right? We domesticated from the mountain goat, the domestic goat. We took from the auroch and made the cow. Uh, we took from the wild um, jungle fowl, we made the chicken. So we made these different animals, and we also did this with plants. So we took um, a whole suite of wild plants and slowly over time domesticated them through that process we made the plants bigger, we made them plumper, we made them richer in carbohydrate or fat, and we bred out of them all of the compounds that, or I don't want to say all the compounds, but the, the bulk of the compounds that had bitter flavors. And in that process, when you lose bitter flavors, unfortunately, you, you lose the tonic medicinal properties because the bitter flavors are indicative of the presence of alkaloids. Mm. phenols and these are the medicinal components so to back this up i know this is a lot but let's let's back it up a second here and say that if we were living in a wild environment like new guinea and we were eating 100 plants a year 
or maybe 150 to 200 plants per year, all of those plants would contain certain medicinal compounds. Now, not because the plant needs the medicine. The reason the medicinal compounds are in the plant often is they're like a type of internal pesticide. Mm. They protect the plant. Um, in large doses, then, many of those compounds would be toxic to us. But in small doses, those plants are tonic to us. They challenge our body. They keep us fit internally, challenge our organ systems. When we breed domesticated plants, of course, we can get rid of those pesticides because now we're going to apply our own or we're going to fence in or we're going to protect those things. And so the plants no longer need to defend themselves. Mm. Now, if we were living in that wild environment and we were eating 200 plants per year, we would be getting the phytochemical suite of each of these different species. This is a lot of different plant medicines. Our bodies would be um, adapting to all of this different uh, chemical information from all these different species. It would be tuning us to our environment. Um, that said, if we um, remove those medicinal compounds, we've removed one of the fundamental adaptive um, factors. So what happens is, I hear a, a canis lupus filiaris back down there. Yeah, that's one in all your country. <laughs> um, if we remove all those alkaloids, we've removed one of the things that um, was fundamental to how we adapted to an environment. So what ends up happening is our bodies develop this deficiency. Um, it develops a deficiency to of these all these phytochemicals. Without these phytochemicals around, these these slightly toxic compounds that are in plants that challenge our organ systems to adapt. If you take those away, it's like taking away exercise from an individual. Mm. Exercise is this great um, analogy because exercise is this thing that challenges the body, challenges the physiology, is slightly damaging to the body, right? When we exercise, we oxidize tissue, we tear tissue, we micro, we do micro trauma to myofascia, and then we regrow. And when we regrow, we're adapted better to that exercise. And if we take the exercise completely away, even though it's a trauma, if we completely remove it, we don't do better, we do worse. Our bodies break down. So what happens if we completely pull away all these wild plants with all these little doses of phytochemical toxins in them is if we actually get weaker. Our organ systems start to break down. They need these compounds to tonify. So how does that relate to herbalism? Here's how it relates. When we talk about herbalism, this took me a long time to arrive at, actually. I love sharing this because it, just, it did take me a long time. In my mind, there were wild plants, there were domesticated plants, and there were herbs. Mm. Now what I understand is there are these domesticated plants. They're very phytochemically deficient. There are wild plants. They're very phytochemical rich. And then herbs are pretty much wild plants or they are what we call semi-cultivars. They're mm. plants that we do grow but we basically grow the wild genome of that plant, yeah. the wild germplasm of the plant. So we're not domesticating it really. So you could buy um, an herb like, you know, I'm sure over there you could buy dandelion root would be a, an herb that's been used in the UK for a very long time. They might even grow those dandelions. They might not be fully, fully wild, but they're not domesticating and breeding the medicine out of that plant and trying to turn it into a big potato-like starchy tuber. It's still the wild plant being grown in, in cultivated soil. So it's a, basically a wild plant. So tonic herbalism is this approach for domesticated people who recognize that their bodies have become deficient in the phytochemicals that keep them healthy. It's a, a way of approximating what a hunter-gatherer's diet would look like. Since we can't eat a hunter-gatherer diet, we can bring in these um, wild or semi-wild plants, and they can feed us those phytochemicals that keep our bodies fit the way hunter-gatherers were. And if people are going, oh, yeah, right, like the hunter-gatherers were healthy, well, here's the news. Um, they didn't get arthritis. They didn't get tooth decay. They didn't get diabetes. They didn't get cancer. They didn't get heart disease. They never had heart attacks. And this stuff didn't exist there. These are all disease symptoms that come to the surface in domesticated culture when we are stripped away from our, our natural nutrient sources and our natural phytochemical sources. So, um, yeah, they were healthier people. And we need to find ways to reapproximate how they lived in our lives. So that's a long answer, eh? Yeah, yeah, that's a cool, an awesome one. It wasn't actually answering the question at all, but that's all good. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a question that comes from that. Um, you know, the standard um, kind of dogma about tonic herbs, which, you know, Von Teagarden has really um, 
brought about in the West is that you have medicinal herbs, right, your inferior herb, and then you have tonic herb, your superior herbs. But the way you've described it so far is like any wild food, basically, the only benefit of it is that it's medicinal and that it's challenging your body. So do you draw a distinction uh, in your no, line? Let's look at that distinction. It's a good distinction, and you're, and you're right to bring that one up. So the idea is that a tonic herb would be an herb that has such a low toxicity that you could eat it like a food. Mm. The idea of a medicinal herb would be an herb that has that action to it, but you couldn't just eat it every day all the time because it would eventually toxify you. I think that's a good distinction to draw. However, I think that when we forage wild plants, we that distinction breaks down a little bit. Mm-hmm. So I think that's why um, I, I'd say Ron Tea Garden's approach is an approach coming from L.A., right? So it's an approach that really is um, tailored to a very Western audience. They're not foraging wild herbs. So yeah, I'd say it's a it's a critical distinction there, um, and I think it's important when people get into herbalism, especially people from Western cultures. Is you know, just today I was I was talking to a client had bought pine pollen from my company Sir Thrival, and this is a product that contains testosterone. Um, I'd consider pine pollen pretty tonic. You could eat it every day. Mm-hmm. Once we tincture it, it, becomes slightly more medicinal. Even though it's a tonic herb, it becomes slightly more medicinal because the alcohol draws out testosterone, and testosterone is great for us. But we can overdose on testosterone as men easily, mm. easily have too much, easily create an estrogen dominance in our body if we do that. This person got on the pine pollen, felt so good, felt such a surge from that testosterone that he told me, I'm going to buy a bottle a week. I'm going to take a bottle a week. Now, I sell this, so I want him to, of course, buy my product. But I had to say, like, listen, that would be overdoing it. Mm. And I need to caution you against that. Now, I bring that up to illustrate in our, we just have that tendency, which like more, 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 more. I think part of maturing with health information is learning how to back off of things quite a bit and learning how to do a little bit less. So I bring that up because there are a lot of herbs that if we overdose on them, we can actually do harm to ourselves. Hmm. And so I think that's the distinction you're drawing. Medicinal herbs are those herbs we have to be careful with because there's the possibility of toxifying ourselves. Um, that can go to extremes. So again, in the UK, you have an herb that was used there called foxglove digitalis. Mm. So it's such a good example. Digitalis, an herb I have right here in my garden, um, that will uh, eventually, you, if you if you overdosed on that, um, you'd have tachycardia. You'd stop your heart, basically. Um, however, for heart arrhythmias, very small amounts of that herb were used. So very small amounts of that herb help to treat heart problems. Large amounts of that herb will stop your heart completely. Mm. So of course, more is better in that situation. Now we've all grown up in a world where we ate basically 10 different plants and they were all hyper domesticated and we didn't have any of these concerns and people have these fears, right? Cause when you talk to people about foraging wild food and talk about wild plants, I mean, you grab a person off the street, how many sentences go before they start bringing up what about poisonous plants? Yeah. How do you know this is safe? I mean, it's right on the edge of people's minds. And with mushrooms, it's even closer, Mm. right? You can't get a few sentences out about picking mushrooms without people being like, whoa, these are really dangerous. Um, People know that the somewhere instinctively that the foods they've been eating are – they're almost, um, geez, there's kid gloves on, right? They're padded off. They're safe. They're, they've been FDA approved. They're, they're non-toxic, right? Whereas we know that the stuff in the wild is a little edgier and we have to be more careful. So we do need that distinction. However, when you start getting into foraging and you start going out and actually harvesting a lot of these wild plants, those distinctions become just a little less clear. It's a little muddier. Yeah, I think even totally harmless seeming things like here we have nettles, right? I'm sure a favourite of yours again, and you know it, it's all good stuff, right? But if you were to get a, like a huge amount of it, juice it all, and drink it all in one go, as I've done and <laughs> observed people do, it's really diuretic, right? It's actually yeah. really dehydrated. People people can often go to the other extreme, you know. Again, as you say, extremes. So like, oh, it's green, it's, it's wild, it must be good for you. I'll have as much as I possibly can, you know. And then maybe that they, they vomit or or have some kind of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I have this memory. Um, I, you know, when I first got into nutrition, it was like the wheatgrass thing was was pretty hip then, and I think that's kind of faded off to a degree. But I was working in a raw food cafe, and I remember uh, on a dare drinking like a full mason jar of wheatgrass juice. And so, you know, and since then I haven't been able to, I can't even smell that. I mean, I've <laughs> it's so much, I can't even go near it. So anyway, we, we learn this stuff, right? Over and over again, we, we actually have to be really careful about doing damage to ourselves. For people who are sort of new to this kind of stuff and they're coming into new foods, I think as hard as it is to hear, 
it's so good to go. Even if you're on super bad food right now and you want to transition, I really think it's important you transition slowly. And here's why, because mm. there's a, a ton of research now finally emerging. It's something I've been talking about for a long time and a lot of other people have been talking about for a long time. We are um, – a symbiotic uh, colony of different organisms. We think of ourselves <laughs> as human, but but we are very little human in comparison to how much bacteria and yeast we are, right? And I'm sure you've heard this, Elwin. Mm. Well, you're about 10 times more bacteria and yeast and viruses than human cells. So for every one human cell, your body is carrying around 10 bacteria, fungi, and uh, viruses, cells. So that's pretty profound. We know that everybody is a mix of different organisms and each person has their own fingerprint or unique blueprint of organisms that you carry, that you are a colony of. And you'll be more closely related to the people you live with and the people you're related with because we're divided by a C. If we took your uh, organism blueprint in mind, we'd see some significant differences because we're not interacting and sharing organisms all the time. Now, all those organisms are uh, tuned to the environment that you've created, your bioterrain through what you eat and drink and air you breathe and the sunlight you get, you are a unique bioterrain that they are adapted to. And if you change that bioterrain really, really dramatically, really, really quickly, like you suddenly overnight go on a completely alkaline diet or you suddenly overnight go on a completely raw food diet or a completely liquid diet, you it's like... It's the way, like, it's similar to how human beings right now are having to figure out how we're going to deal with a dramatically shifting climate here on Earth. If it shifts too quickly, it might shift more quickly than we can adapt to it. If you shift your bioterrain too quickly, you can throw things off for certain organisms in your body and you can create a place where some of those viruses, some of those yeasts, and some of those dysbiotic bacteria who've been held in check by the good organisms in your body, you might create a terrain where they can grow and the good guys can't grow so well. And I only bring this up because I've done it to myself and I've seen it happen so many times that even if somebody came to me right now on the full McDonald's program, I would transition them much more slowly than I would have done in the past. Mm. You know, and I know that's not popular to say that because I know people want this like bam, boom, bang, big, rapid, fast change. But we got to be real careful because your body has found its balance, mm. it's some kind of balance, and you don't want to you don't want to throw it out too quick. And what do you think about those organisms, Daniel? I wasn't going to ask you about that, but as you brought them up, I mean, do you f- do you perceive them as having a consciousness, an intelligence, an intention of their own, or are they just, just merely? <laughs> Yeah, it's funny. It's such a leading question. I think you know what I'm going to say, and I'm sure I have a good sense of what you think. Um, yeah, you know, really amazing, amazing research coming out on all fronts. I was reading about an organism the other day that infects mice, and once it's taken hold in the mouse, it makes mice want to run to cats. <laughs> so they get eaten by the cat. The organism actually wants to be in the cat. So it it wants to infect the cat, but the way it does that is it infects mice, makes mice want to be around cats, and then when the cat eats it, it actually takes up residence in the cat. And that's pretty... Or how about this uh, fungus that infects um, ants and then gets ants to crawl to the top of plants, and then it shoots a mushroom uh, fruit body up through the head of the ant and disperses its spore from the top of that plant, right? So... There are organisms we now know, microorganisms, that can hijack the conscious awareness of, an or, of another organism of their host. Um, lots of research now showing that the organisms that take up residence in our body, particularly when we're infants and uh, toddlers, are um, instrumental in setting up our serotonin pathways. So what happens is if we were not well colonated by these organisms, as adults we'll have lower serotonin levels, which means we'll have... Um, we won't have as um, elevated a mood state. We'll be more depressed people. And interestingly, I feel there's a big connection between intelligence and neurotransmitters. So in my opinion, I think would be slightly less intelligent people um, or at least would be functioning in less intelligence. Whereas if we were well colonated, so say you were raised, uh, you were born naturally at home, you never got antibiotics, you were allowed to crawl around through natural soils and put your fingers in your mouth and you weren't being, you know, sterilized all the time and wiped down with alcohol and the whole, you know, all of that, then you would be well colonated by these organisms. And we now know that you'll have higher serotonin levels as an adult. So you'll have more elevated moods. So um, that's a very simple way of showing how your consciousness is 
is affected by these things. Um, to deepen your question, um, yes, I think that certain types of organisms, for instance, with yeasts, um, I think they can make people crave sugars. I think they can make people crave um, um, the kind of environments with the stress levels that, that promote their growth over your own health. Um, I think viruses are very similar in certain ways. Um, we're seeing more and more about Lyme's disease. This is a great, this is another great one, right? Because Lyme's disease has become very epidemic around the world. When you study the Lyme spirochete, you start to realize how intelligent this organism is. Its ability to create cloaking devices around itself to trick your immune system. Its ability to, to learn how to defeat you. It's just brilliant. So, yeah, these organisms are very intelligent. We're just scraping the surface of understanding, how we're directing our conscious awareness. And ultimately, who are you anyway? Are you the human or is the, is the one tenth of you that's human the vehicle for all these other organisms uh, this is an interesting question does that make sense because if if you have uh, if you have 10 cells and only one is human and the other nine are non-human organisms who's piloting who are you a human piloting these organisms around on you or are you a human machine piloted around by these organisms? And does a healthy profile of organisms make for a healthier person? We're learning that it does. So um, we're speculating a little bit, but we're speculating based off of the direction the, the research is clearly going in. That's awesome. And it's exactly what I found in practice, you know, working with loads of real people all the time. There's this part of them that doesn't want to do what's beneficial. And they know, you know, some of them, you know, even describe that it feels like there's something in me. Um, the, the, the classic way that it's described is almost like demonic possession, you know, like it, there's something in me that makes me want to do it. And afterwards I wake up and I'm surrounded by chocolate bars or, or pizza containers or whatever. And I don't even know what happened, you know, it's like, yeah, you know, it's not quite as simple as we think, right? There's one set piloting us around um anyway we could go on to that but let's let's bring it back into the subject of um herbalism which brings me nicely on to maybe speculating even further daniel would be willing to do that with me which is do you also see that plants you know while plants have their own intelligence sentience intent um and do you yeah. feel <laughs> do you feel like it interacts <laughs> with human beings um it does uh, there's a great um a, a great book, um, The Secret Teaching of Plants, that um, my friend Stephen Buna wrote. And he tells a story in there about, um, I believe, about sheep herders in Australia, people raising sheep, sheep, um, not, I don't want to say herders, but sheep um, farms in Australia. And the sheep become uh, losing the ability to hold on to their baby, so they they're keep miscarrying and miscarrying and miscarrying. And this is like conundrum. What's happening to these sheep? Turns out that they're feeding on all this clover. Turns out that there's high estrogen levels in the clover. Turns out that the more the sheep were feeding on the clover, the more the clover would start producing more estrogens to make the sheep abort to lower their populations. In other words, uh. the, the plant had the ability to figure out how to reduce the population of the organism that was overgrazing it. <laughs> that makes sense? Awesome. This is the kind of thing that's actually going on. Now, my concern, I think, is that when we... Remember, we went from a place where we were more like a spectator in a wild environment, eating from these communities of plants so it's not just that we ate certain plants we ate from these communities of plants um we were visitors in their world so to speak they were here we showed up on the scene as homo sapiens and we eat from them mm -hmm. today is a kind of a different thing we've taken them we've hijacked their genome we've domesticated them and changed them and that's put them under our control so you may see the dog running around behind me here that's my puppy and it's been an interesting exploration and domestication with, the, with having a dog because a dog is derived from the gray wolf and i couldn't get a gray wolf to sit when i asked it to sit right the gray wolf has its own agenda mm -hmm. my puppy is domesticated its genomes essentially been sort of hacked or hijacked and now it's sort of under our control a little bit Similarly, we have these plants who we've hijacked and taken under our control, but now we've taken it further where we're actually splicing their genome, inserting gene sequences from other organisms. And we're taking control. Do those organisms interact with us the way that wild organisms do? I doubt it. 
or it's a changed thing, if that makes sense. So I think that when we eat from wild plants, I believe that they communicate information to us. There's some research now showing that um, micro RNA, RNA would be like the carbon copy transcript of DNA, mm -hmm. that micro RNA from plants might influence up to 30% of our gene expression. Wow. Let me say, let me say it again. Yeah. 30%, right? 30%. Percent of your gene expression. Well, you know, I love this whole thing. Everybody wants to blame everything wrong in their body on their genetics, right? Mm. But it turns out your gene expression is completely influenced by your environment. Mm. And a big part of your environment, plants you eat, and up to 30% of your gene, uh, your, your gene expression is influenced by the micro RNA in plants. Now, what this means is we, by saying this, we're going so far beyond vitamins and minerals and enzymes and all these cute little, that, that kind of thinking, that is such first grade nutrition thinking. We are in the, the age of the iPhone, right? The age of the internet. We, the, the, go, this whole like vitamins and minerals thing is so behind us. But we now are starting to understand that the DNA of plants communicates information and that somehow your epigenome can read the, the RNA from the plants you eat and then actually determine how it's going to express itself. Your DNA can read other DNA by you eating the thing. Oh, my God, that's huge. That goes way past, like, it's got vitamin C in it. <laughs> it's like, what is the plant communicating to you, right? So when you eat a wild plant... Can it communicate to you about what the environment around you is like, what the stresses in that environment are like, what the pathogens in that environment are like, what the solar cycle, what the lunar cycle there is like? I mean, who knows what it's communicating? We don't know yet. When you eat a domestic plant, have you dulled that down? Here's how I vision it. I assume that re eating a, a wild plant or a, or a tonic herb would be sort of like uh, reading an encyclopedia, and eating a domestic plant is probably a bit like reading a TV guide or, uh, you know, a, a reading a, you know, soap opera review or, or reading a tabloid. It's just lower quality information. Eating genetically modified food, maybe that's like giving your DNA porn magazines or something, right? Very low quality Watching information. Commercials. <laughs> just commercials all day. Exactly. Yeah, it, it literally. For, that's great that you'd say that's a great analogy. That's probably better because it is commercial because they are organisms created by commercial entities. So, um, do I feel that information is communicated to us by plants, or plants having a directive intelligence that actually influences us? We know that they do, but we're so early in the research that we still have to be kind of cautious of what we say they do. But if I was speculating, I would say that one of the big things is they tell us how we can be, uh, they tell our DNA, how it can express itself in such a way that it's more adapted to the environment. Um, I think that the average person, if they learned five or six wild plants in their environment, that now foraging, Elwin, is different than um, grazing, <laughs> let's say. When I'm talking about foraging, I mean, we wait for a plant to reach its sort of peak um, ripeness for whatever part of it we're going to take. That might be foliage, that might be rhizome or root, that might be a fruit, that might be a seed. What, say it's blueberries, that would be a fruit, right? We wait for the peak of the blueberry season, then I don't go out there and eat a couple blueberries. I go out there with sacks or jars or containers and I get as much as I can and I bring back all that food. That's what I mean when I'm foraging. It's like going to the supermarket. Okay. Um, that's a great skill. But for the average person, maybe it can start with learning how to just graze a little bit. If you learned five or six plants in your environment that you could even nibble on. So if you learned, you know, nettle, dandelion, uh, burdock, uh, linden leaf, and, you know, I, milk thistle, I don't, I, a few different herbs. And you just, each time you were out walking and you saw those plants that eventually become like friends to you, you see those plants and you just take a little nibble. Even though you're not getting a ton of nutrition in the old world sense of it, what are you getting? MicroRNA that may be communicating with your genome about how it can better adapt itself to your environment. Now, if you're a domesticated creature and that means you are living in the household and you're isolated from your environment, how do you get back to your environment? Well, one great way would be to let the wild plants in your environment educate your genome about how to adapt you back. That's rewilding. So it's just a brilliant feedback loop. So I say learn a few plants you can nibble on and build from there.
start there though, man. I mean, even if you just went out and you, you know, you, you nibble a little dandelion and I'm not talking about you, Owen. when I'm saying this to whoever's listening, cool. go out and nibble a little dandelion. You're getting, you, it's like you're getting into that encyclopedia, you know, rather than when we go to the supermarket and, and we have to go to the supermarket to get our food. I mean, let's face it, that's the world we're in, but that's like the tabloid of food. And it's, it's not educating us about our environment. It's educating us about factory farms where that food is grown. Awesome. And for those, that's awesome. Of, Thank you. A lot of talking. <laughs> that's awesome. And for those to whom, you know, the idea of going out and picking food is just anathema, they're just not there yet, you know, um, would you consider that it's still worth getting something which is pre-made, ready-made? It's still going to be better than the supermarket option, right? Uh -huh. Well, what I would say for people who are just, if that's not you and you're not going to go out and pick things, that's where it becomes more important for you to really get invested in bringing herbalism into your home. Right. For me, I love tinctures. I love tinctures a lot because I'm able to keep five or six little jars, you know, little dropper bottles on my desk. And when I'm working throughout the day, I can just grab and take a shot of that. And I'm putting that plant information into my body. I'm putting those alkaloids into my body. I'm putting those phenols into my body. So herbalism is a way that a human being living in a factory farm can start to make that factory farm at least appear more like its wild environment to your genome. <laughs> you can make your DNA think you're in the wild a bit more. Um, herbal teas, decoctions, I have every day, every day. So every day I, I boil up my teas, every day I blend them with a few superfoods like this, and that drink, while it nourishes me, also feeds information to my genome, and that's the goal. So, uh, so herbalism, super critical for all all of us, unless we are really truly living like hunter-gatherers in New Guinea, it's going to be important that we bring herbalism in. The next step from that is, is realizing that herbalism is a, a living practice that takes place outdoors. Mm -hmm. Even if you live in the city, it's like the city has some of the best herbs around because the herbs tend to grow in areas people disturb. So they're available to you all around, even probably in the back lot behind your place. So knowing that the next step is going towards herbalism. I think if everybody just kind of made this imaginary game, you know, for themselves, like my goal is to be a hunter gatherer as absurd and ridiculous as that is. Right. My goal is to be a wild person. As much as I understand that that's not probably ever going to happen for me. It gives me just a direction. It gives me a focus of like where I want to point to because otherwise, what are you pointed to? What, what's your health goal? Like where, what's your dietary goal? If you don't have some kind of place to point the ship, then you kind of don't know where you're going. So well, I Daniel, always imagine can you, can you that paint, way. Can you paint a picture for us then? Because, you know, what's the benefit? I mean, to most people, wild probably sounds a bit scary, a bit dangerous, a bit weird, a bit unnecessary, right? So what, how, what, what's wild got to do with health? You know, what, what, why is this in any way a goal for us? Great. So what we know is that when, when an organism lives in its wild environment, because all organisms are born out of wild environments, and we are an organism called Homo sapien, and because all organisms are born out of wild environments, they are adapted to those wild environments. Now, living in those wild environments, it's not some kind of utopia, like nothing bad ever happens. They never have any sickness or disease or injury. Of course they do, but nothing on the scale that happens when you become domesticated, right? So a great example would be I have wild lettuces growing all over my yard here. They live fine on untilled soil, unfertilized soil. They are overridden by pests. They just live out here very comfortably. They express themselves beautifully. They grow up to flower and seed. I have some lettuces in my garden, domesticated lettuces. They get attacked by bugs. They can't defend themselves. They're so, f they're so finicky that they need perfectly lush, thick, overturned soil. They need to be protected from the environment. They need to be watered. They actually can't survive unless I take water from some other source and bring it there and feed it to them. These are the same plants, but one's domestic and one's wild. My dog's the same way. My dog lives in the house. Spends a lot of time outside, but my dog is a domesticated dog. My dog could not go live with the wolves. My dog will probably develop um, problems as it ages that a wolf wouldn't develop. I would assume problems with its hearing and problems with its hips based on its breed. Right? We know that domesticated dogs develop problems that we don't see in the wild form. This is so true of humans. Human beings in their natural form, 
it's not natural for us to have bone diseases in our mouth. So it's not natural that our teeth are crooked. It's not natural that our sinuses are compressed. It's not natural that we develop cavities. We don't see that in indigenous peoples. We only see that after they've taken on Western practices. We don't see the heart disease. We don't see the cancer. We don't see just none of this stuff's happening. Their DNA is constantly tuned or their, their epigenome is constantly tuned by their environment. Our environment is incredibly toxic to our epigenome. When we live isolated from clean air, when we live isolated from sunlight, when we live isolated from fresh water, when we live isolated from wild foods, our bodies begin to break down. Now, that's why we see this phenomena. We call it degenerative disease. It's like, it's like when are people going to put it together? What does degenerative mean? It means you're degenerating. It's the opposite. Degeneration is the opposite of adaptive evolution. It's the opposite. Evolution is you get better and better and better, fitter for your environment. Degeneration is you can't, your environment is changing so fast you can't keep up. Your body starts breaking down. That's what's happening to us. We're degenerating. So if we want to be healthy, if we want to truly be healthy, and truly I think really be free, then we got to start to rewild ourselves at some level. Doesn't mean we take it all the way because we can't because look around. You just, you can't. But we can do little, we can make little movements towards it. So my, my favorite analogy is this. I say, if you uh, had a chimpanzee in a zoo, would it make more sense to make that zoo habitat look like, feel like, and have similar things in it to the chimp's wild environment? Would it make sense to put a diet together that at least resembled the chimp's wild diet? Or should we make the zoo look like a living room with a lazy boy chair, remote control, television, cigarettes, soda, and, you know, pharmaceutical drugs? Where will the chimp be healthier? Clearly, it's so obvious we should set up habitat that resembles the wild habitat or the chimp's health will suffer. This is so, I mean, it's a, a child knows this, but then look what we do. To try our environments for healing, we call the hospital, right? That's where people go to heal, right? I love this. You go, how much does the hospital resemble our wild environment? Well, not at all. There's no fresh air. There's no clean water. There's no soil or, or organ. They try to sterilize it, actually. So none of those organisms that keep us healthy are even present. There's no sunlight. There's only fluorescent light. There's full of EMF. Everything's painted white. Everything's sprayed down and sterilized and autoclaved. People go there and they die. That's what they do, right? They go there and they die or they get staph infections. So um, it's really interesting. We can't figure out with ourselves that we should make our zoo environment at least resemble our wild environment. That's pretty funny. The other thing that's funny about it is it's kind of like this. If, if you want to know how to set up the chimp's environment, there'd be kind of two approaches, right? So say we were going to set up that, we, we realize this. We recognize that we should re- make a, a envi- habitat that resembles the chimp's wild habitat. So we are going to ask around, how do we do this? We could probably go ask the zookeepers, hey, how, you know, what do chimps eat? What's natural for chimps? What's healthy for chimps? Unfortunately, the zookeepers probably don't know. So really what would make more sense is we should go research, look at, or even go to where chimps come from and look at what they do there. It would make more sense to ask Jane Goodall what the diet should look like than it would make sense to ask the the zookeeper. Hmm. We ask our zookeepers how to take care of our health. Who are our zookeepers? Well, let's say our doctors, right? We go to the zookeeper and ask them how to take care of our health instead of looking at indigenous people who live in wild environments who are healthy. Instead of trying to base it off them... We go to the zookeeper and ask, and the zookeeper doesn't know because they're not educated in this. They're educated on how to hold the zoo together. Now, break down in my metaphor, my metaphor about the zoo. Here's the difference. Our environment isn't actually a zoo. Our environment's like a factory farm. So it's slightly different, right? It's um, in a zoo environment, you don't try to pack as many of the animals into a small space as possible. That's not what a zoo's about. Ours, a factory farm's about that. That's what our environment's like, right? Um, every animal doesn't get sort of a tagged number. That's what you do at a factory farm, not at the zoo, right? Here, we all get our number tacked to us, right? And here, we're, it's all about producing something from us. So a zoo isn't about producing meat from an animal. It's not about producing milk from an animal. It's simply a place where we get to observe these animals. Our environment's different. It's about getting human beings to produce labor. So um, we really live in more of a factory farm, so we have a little more work cut out for us because we've got we've to get real clever 
about how to take care of ourselves because this environment was never set up for us to be healthy. It was never set up for us to be free. It was never set up for us to feel sovereign. It was never set up for your benefit. It was set up for the benefit of people who live off the labor of us. So we got to be really clever and find our way back. So I teach this path of rewilding because it, it's deep on a lot of levels because it's, it's not just, oh, we're going to be healthier. It's that, oh, if we don't, we're on a path that leads us to such a deep state of um, negative eugenics that we may lose our ability to reproduce. We may lose our ability to um, sustain our lives past age 30. I mean, who knows? This is getting worse and worse and worse. So why do we point ourselves towards the idea of wild people? Because the, that was the last known location. If you're lost in the woods, you got to find your last known location. The last time we were healthy, we were hunter-gatherers. That's excellent answer. I'm thoroughly convinced. I'm really like plotting what I'm going to do next to be more wild. That's awesome. Um, you said something really interesting there. So who is benefiting from this situation? That's what I don't understand. Who are the factory farmers? Who are? Yeah. <laughs> I don't like you great to know that answer, right? Yeah, I wish I had that answer. I mean, I, and it's funny because um, – a lot of people have their answers, right? So there's all these popular theories floating about, and they, like, people love to call them conspiracy theories. Um, but all those, all those guys who are like supposed to be whatever Illuminati or whatever, they're living what they're living um, tamed as well, right? They're living domesticated. Yeah, so, they're yeah, suffering they're, from the like, same diseases. Like, they eat better than us. Okay. Um, they definitely <laughs> eat better than us. Uh, there are, yeah, but I'd say you know it's the elite of the world, and it's the elite of the world lives off the fat of the land. And it's a similar situation to what you had in the, say the UK in the dark ages, right? And the people were in a sort of serfdom mm. and they were heavily, heavily te- Everything they produced was taxed and fed back to, um, the, the ruling elite of the ruling elite, of course, in exchange gave the people protection. Mm. That's what we have right now, right? You know, here in America, we have the protection of our TSA. Mm. You know, over there, you are you in England right now? Yep. Yeah. So right now, I mean, with your Olympics, you know, it's amazing to see the level of militarization that's happened in London right now for the protection of the people, right? So you guys are very heavily taxed. Your labor is very heavily taxed, and in exchange, you get protected. Mm. So um, yeah, more I don't know than anyone else in the world. Yeah. So you guys protection. are. Your factory farm in England is probably the most extreme of anywhere in the world. The United States is barreling towards that, and there's some other places that are barreling towards that. But it's getting to um, be where you – it's just getting more and more extreme. And I think that the more we look at ways we can rewild ourselves, just the better off we're going to be as far as not just our health but how much we can free our minds up because the whole point of the, the, best, the best slavery or the best servitude is where the, the slave feels they're free. That's the best kind of slavery for the elite, right? So here in America, we have this, you know, freedom. It's all about freedom. We're so free. We love our freedom, right? That's what America's founded on, freedom. Mm-hmm. And um, we're shouting that more than ever, and yet we're the least free we've ever been. Mm-hmm. It's kind of the ideal Orwellian situation. So anyway, what I love about rewilding is when you start to really consider how the earth was set up for you to be free, and you start to go experience some of that, like find a spring, right? It's like about free water, Mm. foraging. It's about free food. When you start to encounter those things, it really starts to crack open the, I guess, the very restrictive, um, indoctrinated paradigm, the paradigm that was really the operating system. You know, you were born and educated and given basically an operating platform for your mind. And that operating platform encouraged you to believe that the way things were set up was um, for your own benefit, Mm. was the best way, the way that was best for you, right? And when we start to encounter nature, we start to realize, wait a second, this program's not set up for me, for my health, for my benefit. It's set up to milk me of labor. And um, at the expense of my happiness, at the expense of my freedom, at the expense of my health, ultimately. So... I think a lot, a lot of people can really freak out about that, right? So we're not looking at how terrible things are. We're not looking at you know feeling sorry for ourselves or fearing this or that. We're just talking about how we can return to what is natural and normal as best as what we can. Yeah, and and how do we how do we contrast what's going on now? For me, it's when I go into nature. When I'm in nature, if the contrast is so stark, I realize, wait a second, 
Like that life that I grew up in, that life that's encouraged for the people is not fulfilling because I'm isolated from the source. I'm isolated from nature. I'm isolated from where health really comes from. I'm isolated from the elements. When I immerse myself, and we are free enough to do that, we can go into nature. You have that um, liberty currently. Take advantage of it. Get out there and start to rewild your mind. You know, it's like taking the red pill or the blue pill. You have this great opportunity. It was an amazing opportunity, not just to get healthy. The health is a byproduct. Mm. Encounters with nature free your mind. They ultimately free your mind. Awesome. Um, let's get into some action steps. Um, I had a couple of questions I wanted to ask you about herbs still, which will hopefully, you know, because these are awesome, but they're big concepts for most people. You know, it's like, oh, what am I going to do? So, yeah, what, what do I do, right? Yeah, exactly. So what do we do? What's the action step? Um, and just first of all, we've talked a lot about plant herbs, right? Can we look just for a second at animal herbs as well, you know, and even the fact that we could call animals a herb, you know, or wild <laughs> foods, you know, because, I mean, I'm, I'm a vegetarian personally, Daniel, but... Um, but still, and that's all my life I've been that way, but I still see the value, you know, if you watch like a documentary like Earthling, something like that, and you can see it's appalling what's being done to a lot of animals, right? Uh, It's absolutely disgusting. And yet, on the other hand, um, it is true that I've had clients who seem to really suffer when they want to be very strictly vegetarian or very strictly vegan because there's maybe their body doesn't know how to make iron, you know, from um, uh, or how to make blood anyway, red blood cells from, you know, purely vegan food, whatever it might be. So um, I draw this really clear line between, you know, animal foods that have come from slavery and torture and animal foods which are, you know, wild. Um, yeah. would you, you know, agree with that? And do you have more to say on that? And, um, well, this- incidentally, I love to, you know, my background, I it was a, a long-term vegetarian of probably about 15 years and, and then a good 10 of that being a vegan. So, mm-hmm. um, that changed for me in the last few years and it was very dramatic experience for me. Um, a lot of paradigm shifting for me today. I love to challenge the vegan concept and I feel that I'm in a position to having had lots of experience in it. Um, and I love to draw a distinction between, um, enslaved plants and free plants. Yeah. I really like that distinction because to me, I don't, I understand what people are saying when they draw that distinction that you just made. So the difference between, um, a cow raised in a factory farm and a bison on wild plains, very different scenario, Mm. but not much different than, corn in a monocrop genetically modified Monsanto um, farm, basically factory farm, and wild teosinte in South America. Mm, Yeah. Very, very similar situation. And earlier, you and I touched on that plants may be beyond, they might have some kind of innate intelligence. They are certainly alive. They certainly adapt. They certainly evolve. They certainly have their own desires, their own whims, their own need to self-replicate. They change the environment around them. They can even change the animals that are eating them, right? So plants, I feel, have an intelligence, and I like to make the distinction between the both. Um, Life is life, and all organisms eat other organisms. So I don't see – I understand also that when we say predation or we talk about predators, that we are talking about usually uh, one animal killing another animal for food. But I think, uh, let's face it, if we really want to be egalitarian – for instance, the days of talking about women like they're some kind of uh, subclass of humans is over, right? Mm. If you tried to talk about women like they were less than men, um, most people won't accept that anymore. Um, If we try to talk about different races of humans in that way, that's not acceptable anymore. That was very acceptable. You go pick up a book from the 1800s and read it and you'll find bigotry you won't believe. Mm. That was just accepted then. Um, At some point, I hope that we arrive at a place where we see all life forms as valuable and equal. Mm. Once we do, we're going to be faced with this interesting conundrum that all organisms are predators. Some predate on plants, some predate on animals, some predate on uh, fungi, some predate on microorganisms. But all organisms predate on on other organisms. That's how they survive because life has to feed on other life forms. You're being predated right now by dysbiotic organisms that are trying to eat you. And if you died right now, lots of organisms would come to feed on you. This is just the reality of it. So for me, whether we feed on dead plants or we feed on dead animals or we feed on dead fungi, it's difficult for me 
to draw the distinction. I know that people in the vegetarian community draw a very strong distinction at uh, animals. It seems like they draw an even greater distinction around mammals. It seems like that distinction gets even greater when it gets to, um, say, primates would probably be the most challenging. And then probably the biggest taboo would be human-on-human -human cannibalism, right? If we really can rewild our minds and be open here, we can talk about these things without too much like, oh, I can't believe he said it. But like, we have to spectrum. We're, we're most comfortable if you wanted to kill a virus. We're least comfortable if you wanted to kill a human. And we see all life forms as a hierarchy. This is funny because this, this hierarchical thinking led us to this world of slavery, didn't it? Mm. Ultimately, right? And it leads to a world where men are, are fraternal and therefore will exclude women because they, they want to stick together as men. It leads to a place where white people want to stick together with other white people and exclude black people. And black people want to stick together with black people and exclude white people because it's all hierarchical and we want to be around the things that we're most, most akin to. So to me, I see vegetarianism as a kind of speciesism, personally, um, because it's not a natural expression for human beings based on what we see in wild environments. So it's a choice that gets made. Actually, I don't want to say that. Vegetarianism, I don't see a speciesism. Uh, veganism, which is a, a very strong um, hard -line approach to things where it's like, you know, this is wrong, immoral, you should not do this. There's no historical precedence for that. So it seems like speci speci speciesism to me. That said, um, I mean, are there... I mean, personally, I haven't been hard line with it. You know, I'm happy to have polyruckus ants or krill oil yes. or really anything that agrees with me. Um, to me, it's more and about the results. Vegetarian. You said vegetarian, which is a, yeah. a, a very different thing, right? Veganism is like a kind of militant vegetarianism. Mm. Vegetarianism is a very... I mean, I'm vegetarian most days of the week. Mm. Um, oh, you are? That's, okay. Yeah, yeah, I am. Even with um, herbs? You don't even have any animal herbs every day, like... Oh, not nothing. No, I don't have anything every day. Um, okay. yeah, I, I, I guess I, I, I do a lot of my, the antler extracts. I do do those a lot, but as far as eating animal foods, I don't eat animal food every day. Um, but it's in my diet. Mm -hmm. I, I hunt, I gather. That's my sort of approach, you know? Um, that said, there are things from animals that are truly, truly crucial to people in my opinion. And some of those things in Chinese medicine were called herbs. Mm. Strangely, things like the antler of uh, cervid mammals in its velvet stage was called an herb. Um, the polyrachis ant, as you mentioned, that was considered an herb. It's interesting territory. It's funny to me how people who are vegetarian are often very comfortable with eating insects. Again, they're different enough from us um, that people don't, aren't so triggered by it. It's just it's fascinating, right? They're like little robots. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, but anyway, I, I do feel that bringing animal food is really crucial. Um, we don't look around historically and find a lot of gatherer hunters. Okay. We find a lot of gatherers, and uh, this kept them healthy. I think there's a lot of interesting in-between territory as well. Um, when we study hunter-gatherers in places where there's honey available, that's usually the favorite food of men and women. That's always fascinated me, um, that people um, will risk the dangers of going after honey and will create technologies like the ability to smoke those bees out in order to get to that honey. Uh, it's that important to wild people to get that food. Mm. Um, and that's of course an animal derived food. So there's, um, there's a lot of foods that we adapted to. We adapted to insect eating, uh, also called, uh, entomophagy. Uh, we are adapted to that. Uh, every indigenous culture we, we can find does that. Um, that's one of those things that we have, Anyway, so the point is, just like I said before, if you eat a domesticated diet, bringing in the herbs helps to replicate your natural diet. Um, bringing in some of these animal herbs that you talked about helps to replicate our natural diet. Mm -hmm. If we're in a zoo, we can't eat the natural diet, but we can bring in things that resemble it. So when we do things like polyrachis ant, when we, I'm a huge fan of velvet antler extracts, we bring those things into our lives. It just helps to bring back some of what would have been in our diet or things that were like what would have been our diet if we were natural people. I love that distinction about the zoo. That's, that's a really excellent one. Um, so, Daniel, for people who are, you know... Um like, wow, that's awesome, but, you know, I'm probably just going to go back to my nine-to-five job or whatever. What kind of, you know, what's the top three, top five, something like that, herbs that you would recommend that they would definitely benefit from including, not including the local wild ones, right? So more general okay. ones. So if we were going to get involved in sort of the commercial herbs that are available to us, what's really valuable? Mm. I think some medicinal mushroom is a really, really good idea. Mm. I personally, chaga is, is my 
mushroom of choice has been for a long time. It just tastes so good. <laughs> yeah. I, I like to take chaga. I boil it for about an hour to two hours a day. I repeat boil it. In other words, rebrew it and I make blended drinks out of it. So that's something that's in my life most days of the week. Um, reishi mushroom is another huge favorite of mine. Those two have just been like totems for me. They're totemic. I use them regularly. Um, I produce extracts for my company out of both of those herbs. So I'm a huge fan of those two. Um, so I would say those two or other medicinal mushrooms, cause there's lots of medicinal mushrooms, but the point of them is mushrooms really help our immune system to adapt. And they also help our body to stay cancer free. So finding a medicinal mushroom that you like that works for you and bringing that in, that would be like one of the top things. Um, I would recommend bringing chia seeds into your diet. We don't usually think of chia seeds as a herb, um, but they um, produce a mucopolysaccharide. That's that gel that they produce. Yep. That mucilage, that fiber is incredibly valuable to um, restoring the environment of our intestinal tract, for keeping our bowels really regular, for helping to absorb bile salts from the liver that contain uh, toxic fat-soluble substances and help us eliminate those. And chia seeds also help to restore our omega-3 to omega-6 fatty acid balance, um, which for most people is thrown way out of whack. So I think chia seeds are one of those things you could eat every day. Mm. Um, it would really good. Um, I'm finding more and more pine pollen to be this really ideal herb for people right now. I initially thought it would be for men, specifically for men, but I'm finding that women are benefiting from it too. Um, for people who feel that their, their sex hormones are very balanced right now, or for people who are very young, taking pine pollen as a whole herb, in other words, taking it as a powder and blending it into drinks, be fantastic. Um, for people who want to increase the amount of androgens in their body, those those um, androgenic hormones like testosterone or DHEA, taking a tincture of pine pollen I think is a brilliant one. So that's an herb that I'm big on. I'm also big on nettle root um, for men. So I think for guys, nettle root's just brilliant for keeping the testosterone free in your bloodstream and for protecting your prostate. So that's an herb that I combine with pine pollen I use really regularly. Let's see, other big ones for me, antler extracts. I think for people who are doing the rewilding thing, especially for people who are into exercise, I think it's brilliant for recovery and for growth, for adaptation. So that's another big one for me. I think it's important that people get real honest about what challenges they have in their body. Mm. And I want to say this publicly. I think it's important for me to say this. I have health challenges and every health educator I know has health challenges. Mm. And the internet has made this convenient world where we can edit ourselves into exactly how we want to be perceived, right? So the thing about a lot of health educators is that they can somehow public can become convinced that those people ha have perfect health. And it's just not the case. I, I know a lot of the big names in the health world, and I'll tell you, we all have our challenges. What is important is that we take a real critical look at what our challenges are. We research those individual challenges and we find herbs that are really suited to those, if that makes sense. Yep. Um, here's an example for me. I have a tendency to uh, accumulate salts and water in my body. If I eat really rich food, uh, if I don't get enough exercise, if I don't use herbs that are diuretic, um, I can kind of tend towards slightly swollen feet. I'll feel it in my fingertips. I just have a tendency to hold fluid. And I think if I ate a standard diet, I might even tend towards things like gout. Um, I have to be aware of that. I have to be cautious of that. You know, you see this in guys all the time, the real red face, right? The red nose, the puffy belly that'll happen. I'd be one of those guys if I didn't really take care of myself. So I have to use herbs that help me flush fluids a lot. That's not everybody. That wouldn't be the kind of thing that everybody needs to do. But I benefit a lot from burdock. I, bet a lot, I benefit a lot from dandelion. I benefit a lot from yerba mate, which I use as a diuretic and a central nervous system stimulant. So... Um, for me, uh, coffee's not the thing, right? That's not an herb that really benefits me. That's an herb that's real destructive in my life. But I benefit a lot from yerba mate, which I use as a stimulant in the morning, but is very mildly stimulated and is extremely diuretic for me. So it helps me flush fluids. I really like that. And I want to bring that piece in too. I think that it's important that people get honest about their stimulant use 
And I think it's important that they find a stimulant that they can sustainably use because most people are going to use a stimulant of some kind. Most of us like stimulants. We're raised on stimulants. Native peoples use the stimulants that are in their environment. And there's a whole host of amazing stimulants out there that aren't as destructive as the ones that we've been using. Tobacco, coffee, and the forms that they're being used today are incredibly destructive. The energy drinks that people are consuming today, right? That stuff, I'm sure you guys have that in the UK like we do here at all your checkouts. I don't know if you have that, but with all these little five-hour energy caffeine things or taurine drinks, the Red Bulls, all the kind of stuff that people use. Um, there are herbs out there. Again, mate is a great example. Wayusa is another great example of herbs that are sustainable, that are mild, that don't make you feel like you've, you've overjacked your nervous system but can help you um, get those stimulant needs met. Another herb that I really, really like, um, I know it's been controversial or whatever, I love cacao. Mm. Really, really think that putting neurotransmitters into our body is really good for our brain. So um, I think cacao is one of those herbs that we can use, you know, moderately uh, to uh, make us more intelligent, to help modulate our mood, to feed that need that we have to get high, which I just think that everybody kind of, Hopefully they can be honest enough to relate to that, that people like to alter their state. Animals like to alter their state. We know that. So herbs that can help us do that on a day-to-day without taking us too far out of balance are fantastic. So, uh, yeah, there's a, there's a small list. I could go on. <laughs> That's awesome. Oh, but, yeah. Do you want to ask you one more question, Daniel? Yeah, please. It's uh, about the subject you just mentioned. I was going to let it go, but I really want to ask you about this. Hormones and neurotransmitters, you know, um, especially neurotransmitters. I'm really fascinated with the brain at the moment, you know, and I've been fascinated with neurotransmitters for a while. Um, Is it your experience that, you know, herbs, whether it's plant or animal ones, can change their neurotransmitters to – because basically what everyone wants, you know, if you boil, boil it down is to feel good, right? Yeah, And the way you feel really boils down a lot to your new neurotransmitters, how many you've got, what balance they're in, how much you're reuptaking, all the rest of it. So what would be your favorite herbs in that regard in terms of feeling good yeah. rather all than right, being well, healthy? I have to back. I'm sorry, but i got to give a little background on this. Sure. Cool. It's not like we're all these – it's not like each of us kind of shows up today – on this interview, everybody who's present with us listening to this, it's not like we all show up here without baggage, right? We're all kind of damaged goods because our culture beat the crap out of us <laughs> some level, right? Of course. Cool. We now know that if you didn't get the flora in your intestine, you as an adult will not produce as much serotonin and there's not a way to backtrack that. That would be a challenge that you'd bring to the table that you would live with and learn how to modulate but would be one of your dominant challenges would be you'd have low serotonin levels. Um, how about take an individual like myself who um, had a very traumatic childhood, um, fairly normal childhood in a lower socioeconomic level here in the States, but you know ultimately pretty traumatic. So the limbic part of my brain received a lot of trauma. Mm. My body is more addicted to uh, norepinephrine and adrenaline than it is to feel-good molecules like anandamide and serotonin. If my anandamide and serotonin levels, those are the the molecules that make us feel love and make us feel happy. When my levels of that come up, I notice a tendency to want to push those aside and go towards feelings of um, stress. I grew up in a stressful environment, so I'm adapted to that. Does that make Mm -hmm. sense? Absolutely. Okay. So we're all like that. You see yourself, uh, what, where you like to be. I know people who, who need to feel blissed all the time. And if things even become remotely stressful, they panic. They need to artificially create bliss all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, some of us need to artificially create chaos all the time. It has to do with how, um, our neurotransmitter profile levels were when we were growing up and our brains were developing ultimately. So we got to find out how to balance ourselves. Oh, can I okay. stop you there? We're not doomed to yeah. that though, are we? It's not like... I don't think that we're doomed to that, but it's like this. It's like um, there are certain things. It's not that we're doomed. I don't want to say that we're doomed to it, but that there's a certain point at which you go, okay, I accept this about myself. Like I've been working on this issue I just mentioned for, you know, 18 years. Mm-hmm. How do I reverse the trauma that I had as a child? It's like a big scar. If you have a big scar. It eventually becomes more about you can try to get rid of that scar. You can try all kinds of tricks. You can put your colostrum on it. You can massage the scar. Ultimately, it's like how do you not only live with the scar, how do you celebrate the scar as part of something that you carry with you? Does that make sense? It does, but I just disagree with it from personal experience. I mean, I went through a lot of trauma. Um, I, uh, you know, a father who repeatedly beat me and kind of tried to kill me and stuff like that at one point. 
And um, and I really do feel good these days. And I actually had my brain checked. Oh, okay. I had my brain. I, I know good. my brain checked, and he's like, "Yeah, you actually don't have signs of that trauma in your brain anymore. It's not scarred. You're actually you're okay. Um, you, I would never have guessed any of that stuff would have done to you. And of course, neuroplasticity does indicate that the brain can change and regrow That's and good. all the rest of it. And so, yeah, I used to be addicted to misery and fear and all that kind of stuff, and I'm not anymore. And so Absolutely. that convinces me it's at least possible for everyone. And I want to, you, you said about brain plasticity, totally agree. But you have seen things and understand that there are parts of the world that exist that some people don't have any reference point for. Is that fair to say? Absolutely, yeah. Right. And those things give you perspectives that some people just don't have. Absolutely. And there are things that you can not only accept but understand that exist in the world that some people can't accept or even admit exist. Yeah. And some people have seen even crazier things. Sure. So we carry, we carry with us information, yeah? And I think that each one of us, I don't mean that, that I'm as a result of my traumatic childhood addicted to misery because I'm not. Mm. And I don't, but I do see that I, I function really well in extreme states. Okay. How about that? So I found that I do really well in emergency medicine. So I did ambulance work for a little while. Right. I did really well in um, situations where people would normally dissociate who had never had any trauma because I learned how to function in trauma and actually function very well, whereas a lot of people might freeze or mm. panic. Mm. So I took from the trauma, um, how do you say it, benefits that have come with me that I now have. As a result, I have to be careful because I prefer states of chaos. They focus me that would actually imbalance a lot of other people. So say in my work environment, um, when things get real stressful, I get excited. I know how to function in this. That's a fun place for me. But some of the people I work with might be like, whoa, this is too much. Why, you know, whoa, this, I don't want this kind of an environment around me. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. So for, okay, so back, backtrack. I figured out for myself that I need to um, be sure that I start to adapt myself to neurotransmitters that I might not got a lot of when I was younger. Yeah. For okay. instance, serotonin, great example. When I eat things like cacao and I get anandamide and serotonin, there's these good feelings that are almost slightly alien to my physiology. Mm. And it's almost like <laughs> I have to learn how to allow those feelings. Yeah? Because you Can don't identify them easily. Uh, because they're not the one, they're not the environment that I grew up in. Right? Mm. It'd be like if you took a popper off the street and you bring them into a mansion and a, a millionaire lifestyle overnight, and you'd think, oh, wouldn't this be great for them? But ultimately, they would be like, whoa, I don't know how to function in this. All the rules have changed. Mm. Does that make sense? Definitely. So I don't need to say that we're we're trapped with anything or stuck with anything. I think we actually benefit from the stuff that we bring with us. But they change us. They affect us. Mm. So anyway, my point being, I think for people who have a lot of trauma in their background, um, an herb, a great example would be cannabis. Is this amazing herb that can bind to your, can put THC in your body that binds to your anandamide receptor. And for some people who've never really experienced a feeling of comfort, just general comfort, mm. an experience of relaxation, experience of bliss, an experience of everything's okay, an experience of I can open up to love, that herb can really, really help them. But for some people, that herb would totally imbalance them, right? So we know cannabis can totally throw somebody into laziness and stupor. Whereas somebody else, it might actually allow them to have healthy relationships. Does that make sense? Okay, I yeah. See, I see that happen with people. Um, I see that um, each one of us kind of got to figure out what kind of neurotransmitters we need. Ultimately, you kind of hinted at this. There's a lot of what are now considered illicit drugs that um, were once considered natural parts of human diets. Mm. Um, what we now call like the magic mushrooms, right? The psilocybin mushrooms, they were used, um, shamanically to help restore and heal people's minds and spirits. Um, today they're illegal. Cannabis is another great example of an herb that today is illegal. Um, the South American herbal concoction called ayahuasca, another awesome example, the, the, um, Mesoamerican and South, uh, Western United States herb peyote, the, the herb of the high Andes, uh, coca, all of these herbs that contain neurotransmitters and alkaloids that actually, um, create brain plasticity. Mm. Yeah. Right. Yep. What those herbs do 
in the presence of neurotransmitters, we have brain plasticity. We can start to change the brain. Now, I think that's what you were kind of hinting at before is that you have the ability to restore and restructure your brain. However, it's almost like if you had a piece of plastic and the plastic was rigid, it'd be hard to shape it. It'd almost be brittle. You might break it. But if you could slightly heat it up and make it malleable, you could start to shape it back to what you want it to be. So there's herbs on the very mild end like cacao and on the real extreme end, maybe ayahuasca, which is two herbs, that create brain plasticity. And if we use them properly, they give us an opportunity to start to restructure our brain into what it, what it can be. So somebody who has a traumatic, say, beating in their background, they can use those herbs. And in those herbs, they can have cathartic moments, emotional processing, uh, restructuring, um, changing memories. They can change a feeling associated to a memory and start to bring a brain from a traumatic place back into a place of balance. I think somebody who grew up in a very coddled world, that'd be the opposite of abuse, can actually begin to have realizations about the world that otherwise were kept from them by parents who maybe sheltered them too much. Mm. They can begin to connect and realize that the world is a bigger place than they realize. So those kind of herbs, I think, have a a tremendous value um, for a lot of us who have healing to do upstairs, particularly in our limbic system, but they're illegal. Uh, The factory farmers don't want those herbs to get into the factory farm. They're highly regulated. I find that very interesting. Um, Yeah, I think that um, a lot of people don't know that they can change. Their brains are plastic enough that they can change some of this stuff. And what they end up doing is they use pharmaceutical medicine, antidepressants, let's say, that um, allow them to forget how they feel but mm-hmm. never allow them to change the brain. So they never actually heal. They just stay in a stupor and they live with it. But they maybe feel better dur- while they're on the drug. Whereas I think these entheogens I'm talking about actually allow you to feel better when you're not on them. That's, a, I mean, these are herbs that at some point need to be liberated and set free so that the people can use them. And, and I think that the factory farmers need to understand that the people can use them responsibly. It's ayahuasca actually illegal then in the U.S.? Yeah. Okay. I don't think it yeah. is over here. Um, and aboga as well. I mean, aboga is something that we yeah. like to use over here, which is, you know, incredibly beneficial. And I have to say, you know, by my brain checked and it was all, you know, okay. That was after doing an aboga session. I think that may have had something to do with it. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. And, you know, interestingly, both ayahuasca and iboga have been, uh, re- very, become very uh, well known as um, opiate treatments. So mm. heroin. And people on synthetic, you know, here we have a huge problem in the United States with a synthetic heroin called Oxycontin that the pharmaceutical companies will give you even if you have a little back pain. Mm. Before you know it, you turn a person into a complete addict. And here what we have are people who started out with a little back pain who now rob pharmacies, right? This is what, where it's gone. Um, these people are often uh, can be treated, not just treated, but they can actually recover from those opiate addictions by using an herb like iboga or using a, a suite of herbs like ayahuasca. So these things just, again, they, we, we need to find legal safe ways to use them so we don't put ourselves at risk. Mm. We need to be very careful. Uh, but these herbs are out there, and if used responsibly, they can really help us. Awesome. Thank you so much. I mean, that's been absolutely fascinating interview. <laughs> we may have got into more than we were originally intending, but, you know, I really appreciate you sharing so candidly and so honestly. Yeah, um, if people wanted to find out more about you, um, I already mentioned a couple of your uh, websites, and I'll put them underneath, but is there anything else that you would like to um, particularly give a shout-out to? Well, I'll just say that danielvitalis.com, which is my blog site, gives you access to uh, my other websites, Find a Spring, Um So check there. You can see what I'm writing about, what I'm interested in right now. That's where I talk about rewilding and just sort of different things that I'm doing and finding really useful. Um, so you can find me there, DanielVitalis.com, and you can also find put my name into YouTube, and there's plenty of free videos there of me talking about all kinds of things. That's awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing, Daniel. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you, Ellen.